The Texas legislature will vote on thousands of bills each session. Often these debates can get overlooked, even on critical legislation. That's why we've asked legislators to come to the Texas Public Policy Foundation to talk about their bills so that you can stay on top of the most important issues making their way through the Capitol. This is The Layout. I'm Andrew Brown, Policy Director for the Right for Families campaign, and today we have a special two-for-one episode of The Layout for you. I'm with Senator Donna Campbell and Representative Tom Oliverson. Senator, Representative, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Andrew. Now, this is an issue that's really sparked a lot of public debate in recent years. Tell us about how you got involved in this issue originally and what problem you're trying to solve. Well, I think I I first really got involved in this issue last session on a bill that was filed by my colleague, uh, Representative Krause, uh, basically looking at the same issue that we're currently looking at. And sitting on the Public Health Committee and hearing the testimony on that bill, uh, I began to do my own research and I realized, you know, as a doctor, as a scientist, that what people think they know about gender modification and what what a child's perception of gender is and how we should treat that, that the science out there is really pretty shoddy. Um, I would say borderline unacceptable uh, as even being classified as science. And yet we are doing irreversible, life-altering procedures medically and surgically to young people Um, on the basis of this, I would say, very incredible research. And then when the CAS report came out of England last last year, and they basically shut their clinic down after a systematic review because they realized that the science just wasn't there to support what they were doing and the consequences and the complications were just mounting, Mm -hmm. I realized that something had to be done. So I reached out to my colleague, Senator Campbell, and we said, doctor and doctor, we're going to take this on. Well, that's great. You all have teamed up on this legislation. Dr. Campbell, can you walk us through the bill and tell us what it does? Thank you so much. And, you know, I can't reinforce enough the importance of having truly another doctor who understands that first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And what is happening out there is permanent changes to some dysphoria that we see in literature is can be temporary and most commonly is temporary. Mm-hmm. So the bill that we are, uh, we've joint, we're carrying in the House and the Senate is one that's going to prohibit medical professionals from providing puberty inhibiting drugs, cross sex hormone drugs, and surgical interventions for children under 18. And let's remember these drugs, when he was talking about lack of research, the drugs they're using. They're off-label. That means these drugs are not meant for what they've been FDA approved for. Mm -hmm. So they're being used off-label, long periods of time, yet, like Dr. Oliver said, we don't know outcomes yet. And then to have a permanent um, transition through surgery, I believe, is mutilation. So what this bill does is it prevents, I mean, normally we work in best practices, Mm -hmm. but what you're seeing out there is not best practice in medicine. So this bill will prevent practitioners from writing prescriptions for off-label pubertal blocking hormones, uh, cross-sex hormones, as well as doing any kind of mutilating surgery. The the bill prohibits, if, if I just walk through the bill, which I think would be clearer for everybody, it defines what a child health care plan is. It prohibits any coverage through a child's health care plan of gender transitioning. And well, let's see, we have a list of surgical procedures mm-hmm. that are prevented. And are there exceptions for some use for uh, cross-sex hormones? Yes. Precocious puberty, breast cancer, prostate cancer. There are reasons that some of those drugs are used. So th- there are some exceptions of it. But for the most part, the surgeries are all prohibited. Prescription of the drugs 
are prohibited. We uh, allow uh, medical professionals that have to treat precocious puberty, or like I just said, right. we allow that. It prohibits any public dollars from supporting the payment for drugs or the uh, surgery at all. Okay, and just make sure that even in rulemaking and state agencies that there is no support for puberty blocking drugs cross sex cross cross sex hormones or any surgery with it and it's really for such a i think a complicated philosophical discussion that's going on out there it's a simple bill mm -hmm. Right. It sounds like you're really just protecting kids from unproven and, quite frankly, what sounds like experimental medical procedures it that is. are intended to facilitate gender transition. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Oliverson, if this bill passes and becomes law, what results do you expect? How will the lives of Texas families be improved by this legislation? Well, so I think, first of all, uh, and I think you were correct in using the term experimentation. You know, we were... As Texans, I think, as Americans um, as well, we were sold a bill of goods on this, that this was sort of the cutting edge, this is where the science was leading, um, and this is you know, the direction that, that science was going. And the reality is, is that country after country that's been down this pathway farther than we have is turning around, and we're still going down the pathway, and they're mm -hmm. meeting us coming back the other way saying, don't go there. You know, this was the bad idea from the start. We should have never done this. So I believe that what if when this bill passes, what will happen is that children, uh, this will not this these treatments will not be available to normal, healthy children. Um, we we are very clear about this that we're talking about medicines and surgeries. We understand it. there are psychological and mental and even psychiatric conditions, uh, gender dysphoria, there are different things that occur uh, where psychological and psychiatric counseling and support is still very appropriate. Mm -hmm. But this would call a full stop moratorium timeout on all medical and surgical treatments to experiment on or modify a child's gender until the age of 18. And our belief is that at the age of adulthood, um, you know, that, then that's a conversation with informed consent and a process that a person can go down with the doctor. But there are really nasty consequences to normal, healthy development of boys and girls um, that would normally occur during puberty, which are completely disrupted through this gender transitioning stuff. Um, and so that has to come to a stop, just as it has in Florida and Alabama and Arkansas and England and Sweden and a lot of other places. So we are not the first to do this, and we won't be the last. So really, helping children who are struggling with gender dysphoria or struggling with their gender identity get mental health services, get counseling mm -hmm. instead of medicalization. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And I think the, the, the most important take-home point for the listeners here is to understand that greater than 60 percent of pre-adolescent people diagnosed, children diagnosed with, quote, gender dysphoria, it will resolve with therapy alone by the mm -hmm. time they eat, reach age 20. So why then would we send them down a pathway of irreversible change through medicines and surgery if greater than one in two people didn't really need that to begin with? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is the reason why we have to call a, call a full stop on this. We're not talking about 3% treatment failure rates or stuff like that. We're talking about a large percentage of children who are being diagnosed who really just need therapy and support who are currently being medicated and operated on, and, and that's what we're going to stop. Dr. Campbell, proponents of performing these medical interventions argue that your bill is an attack on the LGBT community. How do you respond to that criticism? I think sometimes if you're misguided, maybe that's all you have is just saying this is an attack. But it's not an attack on anyone. This is all about protecting children when you look at it. Children should not be, um, they should not bear the brunt of a surgical abuse, what I call it, mutilation for something Dr. Oliverson just described, that, and we know that can easily be temporary, a gender dysphoria. And to have that out there 
that this is an attack on any any community. That's the attack is being perpetuated onto children, and that is wrong. And you just can't bring drugs. Don't don't bring to our children drugs and a scalpel for something that can easily be temporary. Mm. So the attack is on the children. It's not on any specific community. And Several bills have. If, oh, if I ahead. could say one thing uh, to echo what, what Dr. Campbell said is that you know. There is a growing body of literature out there that, that shows that a lot of these children that are being diagnosed with gender mm -hmm. dysphoria and put on these treatments are being misdiagnosed. And actually what they have is the beginnings of same-sex attraction. So I would say that within the LGBT community, um, just this treatment alone is an attack on some of the L, G, and B parts of the community who are being misdiagnosed as T, who will look back later in young adulthood and realize that their whole life was ruined because they were misdiagnosed as a young child with something they never had. And as we're seeing that, we're seeing people mm -hmm. come forward, children come forward, who have been on these medications long term or have undergone surgery, and they wish they never had been. <laughs> What's that like? Who bears the brunt of that? A child without the maturation in their brain to make a fully informed consent? Where is that done elsewhere? We don't even let a child get a tattoo mm -hmm. less than age 18. Mm -hmm. Well, as we said at the top of the show, this is an issue that's been in the public sphere for several years now, and it's a a point of heated debate. Mm -hmm. What reaction have you all received since filing the bill from your constituents? I would say from my perspective, it's been largely positive. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that since uh, since I filed this bill and, and sort of, you know, put my, my sign out that we'd be working on this issue together with my doctor colleague here, that um, both of our offices, I think, I know mine has received uh, feedback from parents and detransitioners and folks who felt that they were really trampled under um, and and treated very inappropriately by what amounts to essentially a misdiagnosis and a social contagion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think neither of us would would debate would would uh, discount the fact that there there probably is such a thing as a gender dysphoria for mm -hmm. real. Um, I think what we're saying is that if that's a truly a, a real thing, we need to be able to separate that from the vast majority of folks that are misdiagnosed, which I believe is currently a large chunk of them. Um, and so I've been really surprised by the number of folks who have reached out to us. You may be aware of this whistleblower report from the yes. Children's Hospital in St. Louis. And, and I got to tell your listeners, quite frankly, that Exactly what that whistleblower says is comports identically with what I'm hearing from parents out here in Texas, that they were lied to, that they were misrepresented, that they were misled. This is almost somewhat of a Planned Parenthood type situation where a person goes in looking for advice and essentially they're ambushed and led down a path that they never wanted to go. And similarly, the same thing we've gotten in our office. But a couple of people have come up to me and said, well, it's about time. Mm -hmm. And when you think about what we're looking at is new enough, what happens when they are off of their parents' insurance, if they have no insurance? How do they get counseling? Maybe they're 30, they had the surgery. And where is their support then? Mm -hmm. And where is those that are proponents of the medications and the surgery? How are they preparing all the children for what they're going to go through in the future? At age 50, what, what happens to them? Mm -hmm. Are they abandoned? That's not being thought out. It's like he said, they're being shuffled through, and it is an ex social. Our children shouldn't have to bear the brunt of a social experiment, and that's exactly what this is. Mm -hmm. Well, Senator Campbell, Representative Olerson, thank you so much for joining us on The Layout. Thank you all very much, and tune in for another episode in the coming days. I'm Andrew Brown. Thanks for joining us.